My name is Abhishek and I have got over 11 years of experience with implementing Oracle Fusion benefits. Before that, I was working with PeopleSaf. I have knowledge about a couple of different ERP systems. All of the session is being recorded. Once we are done with the session, I'll send you the recording along with the presentation that I have made so that you can refer back. We would also, after the session is over, provide you access to the instance and that instance access is there for next 90 days. So you can go in and play around, just log, create your own plan, programs, options. Just in general, be there in the system because that is important. When you're learning new application, it's important to be there in the system and just navigate around, just play around and see how the whole system looks like and how it responds. I would not be providing access uh, right away. Once the session is over, I will send you all the credentials because this is right today. What we are going to do is just do an introduction session. We're going to talk about what Fusion is, what the different, what the agenda for this whole training session would be, what we would be covering in next three weeks, and uh, how it could, how you could leverage this to start doing your own implementation. I have uh, three to four. Oracle Fusion Benefit implementation experience on my back. I bring in a lot of real world examples. I do have a presentation that I have created, but I heard a pretty, really nice uh, quote somewhere is that you know, when you're doing a presentation, you basically tell this person how you're going to bore them, then you bore them, and then at the end, tell them how you bored them. So I probably am not going to do stick around with my presentation, but it will definitely help you after the session is over to go back and just uh, look at what uh, points we covered today. This particular session would cover a little bit of uh, presentation and I'll dive right in into the application to show you how the application looks like, what are the navigation tools that you need to know and how to just get around in the application, what, where to find uh, stuff. And then there's a couple of assignments. In fact, for today, there's just one assignment. Once I send out all the login credentials for you guys, Go in and create the work on the assignment and when we meet next time, show me the assignment so that I can uh, see whether you're progressing or not. So this is a extremely, I would like it to be interactive. I do not want you guys to be, because I have been on some of these sessions uh, in the past when I was learning Fusion and I would tune off after a while, like 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. The session is not interactive. If you're not participating, you would tune off and you would not gain as much as uh, I would expect you guys to gain out of this uh, training session. We'll keep it interactive. I'll ask questions. If you do not know, that is absolutely fine. But it's just so that you you guys are engaged in the session. Does that sound fair? All right, let me start sharing my screen. I'll start with the presentation and uh, talk a little bit about ERP Web Tutor Fusion. Just go through it pretty quickly. It should not take more than five, 10 minutes. Let me know when you guys can see my screen. As you know, our uh, company name is ERP Web Tutor. We've been doing this for a pretty long time. We started with Oracle Apps. Now we have moved to Fusion. But personally, I'm from a PeopleSoft background, so I joined this company pretty recently. So about ERP Web Tutor, it got launched in 2012. Uh, you just read through it. I would not bore you with all these details. But it's just that we've been around, and what we basically always believe in is to provide quality training. We're just not there to just go through our slides and not expecting the students to gain anything out of it. We definitely do not compromise on quality. And at any point of time, you feel that I'm going really fast or slow, or if I have not explained any concept, please text me. I would suggest not to speak when I'm doing the session. It's just because uh, it sometimes becomes uh, disconcerting for other people as well. So you can, whatever questions you have, just text me and I will try my best to answer. Or I could, I would park that. And at the end of the session, I will take those questions so that I could maintain the flow of the session. Okay. The agenda for today is introduction to cloud benefits. We'll talk about that, what deployment options we have, what fusion architecture, functional setup manager. And then at the end, we'll just lightly touch on what the benefit security is. I would not go into details of security, just tell you guys what is absolutely minimum is needed for implementation users to start doing implementation and benefits. 
this is just what is there on the PowerPoint presentation. I would I do also have the application up. So I'll go there and show you some user experience. If I'm employee, how would the benefit module look like? From the implementation user standpoint, how the configuration pages look like? Just to, just to give you a little bit of overview and feel of it so that when we dive in next week, you will have a better understanding of what we're going to do. There are some online resources also available. Those are Oracle publicly available online resources. It would definitely help uh, while we are doing this training is to go and refer those online resources because even though it is not very extensive, it does provide some overview or insight on the topics that are going to be covered and it would act as a supplement of what we are doing in this uh, training session. I would uh, encourage you guys to look into these uh, online resources which are available and make full use of it. Again, I would not go through all the bullet points, but the big picture is that Oracle Cloud has been around for a while now, and it has stabilized. The benefits and payroll, I, I started when it was released six or uh, seven, and at that point of time, it was not stable at all. We had a lot of issues, a lot of client complaints, a lot of functionalities either broken or not even there in the system. But now, that right now that we are looking at release 12, it's, it, it is now extremely stable. At least the payroll and the benefit piece is extremely stable. And it is, in my opinion, at least coming from PeopleSoft background, is that it's uh, much more better than what PeopleSoft used to be. And I, at that point of time, I thought PeopleSoft was pretty good because uh, if we could not configure it, we could always build something around it. But considering that, I still I feel that Oracle Cloud has surpassed that. Right now, the functionality that Cloud provides apart from Cobra and benefits billing is something that they have introduced in 20 uh, release 12 which we gonna touch just a little because our uh, application is right now on release 11 and release 12 is going to be there in uh, next couple of months benefits billing is something which has been introduced but that was the only thing which was missing the other thing which is missing right now and I don't know if uh, Oracle would is going to introduce or not is the Cobra administration that I believe a lot of uh, organizations anyways outsource it. So that's not a pressing uh, issue for Oracle right now to incorporate. But apart from that, I believe the offering that Oracle provides in terms of benefits is pretty extensive. Okay, I have a question from Srinivas. How different... Again, Srini, as I mentioned, that I'm not from uh, OAB background. Uh, I'm from PeopleSoft background. So I would not be really able to tell you how much difference. But I have, I have friends who have worked on OAB, and they tell me that there is a lot of similarities because you have the elements that get attached and all the uh, structure of how the whole benefit program hierarchy is created. I have heard that it's pretty similar to what uh, OAB used to provide. But I would not have a first-hand information because I have never worked with Oracle Apps before. Okay. The next one is, what I was talking about is that the offering is pretty extensive. Uh, and Oracle HCM Cloud in itself is uh, really ramping up. And you guys are at the right point uh, joining this particular, become the implementation leads. Only because right now the total number of implementation that Oracle Cloud has, has is 1,500, 1,500 plus. And in the next five years, that is, they are expecting it to grow to 10,000. So just imagine how many implementation leads would be required in the next five to 10 years. So it's a pretty exploding uh, space, and it's, we guys are at the right time uh, joining this. And we'll talk about the interface and how the, the interface is extremely user-friendly. It is, uh, you can, pull up mobile phone or PDA and start uh, accessing the application and it's, it's responsive. It uh, conforms to the, the tool or the uh, application you're using. And when you get to see it, and some of you have already seen it, is it's pretty intuitive. Earlier, the, they used to call it Fusion and that moniker has continued to be used. But uh, recently, in the past year and a half, what Oracle has started doing is they have started marketing as Oracle HCM Cloud. They don't no longer want to use the word Fusion. 
So they have all their marketing materials and even if you go for any proposals to a new client, you'll see that Fusion, uh, sorry, the Oracle always mentions Oracle at SIM Cloud. They do not mention Fusion. I think it's a sales or marketing decision that they have made to move away from the word Fusion. So no longer you'll see in any of the new materials that come out, they'd be using Fusion. But for us who has been who have been working on this application for three, four years, uh, that uh, terminology still sticks. So I would be interchangeably be using Fusion and Oracle at same cloud. So I just, as I spoke about, there are 1,500 plus customers currently using at same cloud, and this is expected to grow to 10,000 in the next five to 10 years. This is how the look of R11 looks like. I don't know how R12, R13 would look like, and I'll talk about what, he, what these R12 and R13 are, but those are just release levels. But R11 right now where we are at, this is how the application looks like. It looks way different from when we started in R7. So just to give you guys a little bit of idea about these uh, release naming conventions and uh, how, the, how the release works, because it is important that you understand as an implementation lead, because you, whenever you're doing an implementation, you'll always come across, oh, when is the next release, and what are new functionalities that are coming in new release. So earlier in legacy system, what used to happen is that the upgrade cycle was always two to three years. They would come up with a release, and it's installed on your on-premise uh, system, and then you would wait for two, three years, for a new release to come. And that would be a huge undertaking on the part of the whole project team to do an upgrade. So upgrade used to be five, six, four to five, five to six, depending on the complexity of the application that you had. And it used to be a huge cycle. And then again, you'd wait for another two to three years uh, for the next upgrade cycle to appear. And I don't know how the, um, on the EBS side, it used to work, but PeopleSoft side, that's how it used to work. And probably, Shini, since you have worked uh, on it, you can throw a little bit more light on how Oracle Apps uh, upgrade cycle used to work. But in general, legacy system always used to work like that. But now with cloud, what has happened is that the release cycle has become shorter. So the release cycle is now like from six to eight months. So every six to eight months, you'll see that there would be a re new release that would be coming. So I started on release seven, it went on to eight, nine, 10, 11. Right now we are on 11 and 12 is just round the corner. So once we get to 12, then it will go to 13. And with every all of these releases, with every release, they come up with new functionality, new look and feel. And if you are at client side, and you would always have to prepare for your upgrade every six to seven months. And you're always given advance notice that yes this release is coming this is what is coming in this release do you want to use that functionality new functionality that we are releasing so there are pros and cons to it the pros is that you get the new functionalities or new yeah the new functionalities or new pages or anything that is new very soon you do not have to wait for three years for that new functionality to come and that keeps you at the right at the cutting edge of the technology because you always have the latest and the greatest but the flip side is that you always are in a constant release mode because by the time you're done with one release, uh, the next release is already around the corner. So you start preparing for it, making sure that it does not affect your current functionality. Um, it does not affect any of your current configuration. So you have to do all that impact analysis and uh, then go for the release. The good thing is that all this release upgrade and everything is being taken care of by Oracle, so you do not have to do anything on your part. The only thing that you need to do is to find what the impact analysis is, and based on that, uh, make your decisions whether you want to change any configuration or you want to turn on a new functionality that has been delivered. Just to give you a very recent example is that from release 10 to release 11 to release 12, the security in the design has completely changed. So there used to be three different disparate systems that was working uh, together to create your security module, but now they have combined all of that together. So when uh, I'm working with a client right now and we have to do a security design, but we cannot do until R12 is there because there's no point in doing it in R11 since that would not be carried over to R12. So there's a redundancy that we do not want to create. 
you have to be always be aware of which release version you are on and which, what is the next release because always it's six months away only and what new functionalities are coming and as a implementation consultant you need to be cognizant of that and uh, keep your client uh, aware all the time that this is what is uh, coming up and you need to be ready for it so just keep in mind whenever you're doing implementation that you're always aware about the release cycle okay next is deployment options you guys some of you are already aware some some might uh, so i'll just go through it pretty quickly is uh, we have the private cloud the public cloud and on-premise so when we started um, talking about ebs or we are talking about peoplesoft all of that was uh, on-premise and they used to have their own local data centers um, then slowly with the advent of all the cloud application what has happened is that uh, the industry is moving towards uh, the private cloud and public cloud and those are um, two I, I would not say um, two sides of the same coin but it caters to different industry groups so a private cloud is where everything is on cloud and it means that you do not have your own data center but it's only uh, tailor-made for you so what happens is that that particular data center is not being shared by anybody else you do not own that data center but it's only for you so that's a private cloud and usually um, companies who have uh, high secrets uh, or federal agencies they do not want to go on public cloud because if their data is compromised uh, that has a lot of uh, implications and then you have the public cloud every um, other client just wants to go to public cloud because uh, they don't have do not have to pay that much maintenance fee and um, in general life is a lot easier if you're on public cloud um, all of these companies Oracle be it Workday or SAP do say that they have the highest level of uh, security around all of these data centers and they have redundancy built into the system so if a data center goes down they always have another backup data centers but it's it's on public cloud so it depends on what kind of data you're putting and or what kind of data you're dealing with so for 99 percent of the clients the public cloud works uh, like a charm but then you also have private cloud options for clients who are very specific about their data and then on-premise is something that you guys have been using and that's there on your company's system and it's dying a slow death right now as we know so um, that that is no longer relevant anymore it will have its place but not as how it used to be even like three years uh, before um, I would not go through this I just spoke about what uh, I don't think you need you guys already know if you have any questions about any of these terminologies uh, please uh, I am me I'll answer otherwise I'll move ahead and do let me know if I'm moving fast uh, so that I can uh, pace myself accordingly so the cloud architecture uh, how the cloud architecture looks like um, and I'm going I'm doing a little bit of deep deep di deeper dive here um, Aditya, are federal clients using these cloud apps? No, not yet. Uh, they, Oracle has been trying to tout uh, private cloud for uh, federal uh, clients, but still federal client is so married to on-premise uh, because the implications, as you can understand, is a lot higher. If, if any breach happens, and none has happened yet, but they do not want to be the first one to find out. So. Um, it, the adoption anyways on the federal side has always been slow they are some of them have are on EBS versions or people soft versions which are like 10 years old five years old so their adoption rate is anyway slow and considering on top of that uh, all the, um, the unknowns about the cloud application I don't foresee them moving into uh, cloud anytime soon but uh, Oracle is trying to get into that space because it always used to be a lucrative market for them uh, Most of the federal clients have PeopleSoft installed as their HCM So they're what they are trying to do is to tout the uh, private cloud uh, to federal clients and not 
the single one has yet uh, taken the jump uh, into cloud but I believe in next four or five years as uh, this thing keeps evolving we would see more and more clients uh, federal clients joining cloud okay does that answer your question Aditya so Oracle cloud architecture um, we have the functional setup manager so why the it started to be called fusion is that it was fusion of different applications so Oracle already had some of these application applications like OTBI that's for reporting then it had the BPL for handling approvals then it had the BI for BI reporting it had OIM for uh, managing all the LDAP systems so these systems are already in place even before uh, Oracle started designing the fusion apps the these small building blocks were already in place so that's how the whole fusion name came about is that they wanted to fuse all of these different applications together and create one uh, HCM application so you'll see that the functional setup manager is the only application that they created as part of fusion all of the other um, this, the application that was working uh, to do the approvals or to do the reporting or to do the LDAP piece all of that was already in place what they did was they use a functional uh, setup manager to marry all of them together and uh, make it as one single application for the client and that's why they named it as fusion because it was all of these applications were fused together and all of these applications are on cloud so this is how the this is what the architecture of cloud is that you have the functional setup manager which we would be using uh, extensively for in our uh, whole lesson because that's where we'll be doing all our configuration and that's where our uh, ui actually um, is uh, placed and then you have your uh, workflows and then you have your reporting which is built all around it so we will get to see all of these applications when i'm doing a demo probably not today but maybe the next following weeks I will show you how these application looks like and how do you need to navigate and as an implementation implementer you need to know the reporting piece you need to know a little bit of OIM so it's important that you are aware about these uh, applications which are working in unison so this one application that they all also had which is which was called the authorization policy manager and if you remember i told you from release 11 to release 12 the security design has completely changed so what they have done is that they have done away with the authorization policy manager as part of release 12 and it is getting deprecated um, going forward uh, we would not have uh, the uh, apm anymore so this is what uh, is going to happen now going forward is that the whole redesign of uh, release 12 will happen and in security will happen so let me go and show you the application because i have already talked a lot about how the application looks like and what the fusion architecture is so we click on home So you're looking uh, at this application this is when you log in as a user or as a implementer you will see that this is your landing screen you'll have uh, this box in here where and this could always change these are all configurable so you could change this and these are the icons on the we like how we have desktop on windows uh, and icons on it so this is how the whole idea is and you can create shortcuts so and you can remove them as well so let's say for uh, all the employees you want four or five icons to always be visible on your uh, home page you could uh, configure it to show it over here and if you want to see the whole list on the left hand corner there's navigator if you click on it it will show you the complete list so the idea is that it's it, it's, it works exactly how your uh, windows system works like on your desktop you have your icons which are nothing but shortcuts but when you click on your start button you will be able to see everything that your um, windows application has so 
you can draw the analogy analogy that uh, the both this is how uh, fusion has been designed and how windows has been designed it's uh, almost the same and it helps because you have already used windows for so much uh, so long that uh, you know quite intuitively that uh, this is how the system works and that that's the whole design mantra i think from the oracle perspective as well where they wanted to keep it uh, a little similar so that you do not have a uh, learning curve when you are uh, going through this so you have the navigator and uh, go through some of the icons at the top you have the home icon any any link which you think that requires two three clicks you can always favorite it so that you do not have to do uh, that navigation every time you are in the system um, you have a watch list uh, we'll talk about watch list so probably that's an same concept so it's in a core concept, so we have not to delve too much into it. There are notifications, and this is for uh, if you're creating it for accessibility for disabled um, employees, then you have your accessibility options here, and this is help. So for any page you need um, some help, this is where you would go. You would click on it, and then a small yellow question mark appears wherever they have help information. And you can click on it and get uh, um, help on that particular topic. So this is how our application looks like. The benefit section is here. Then you have your payroll, compensation. Then you have all your workforce section here. And uh, all of these links could be controlled using your uh, roles, security roles. So if you do not want to show some of these links, um, you could do that uh, using security. Again, you could hide the whole module. If you're not implementing a module, then it would not show. Um, then you have compensation, benefits, and so for our purpose, this is important, the benefit administration. Um, under Mighty, under About Me, again, there's a benefit piece where as an, uh, when you as an employee go in, you would be able to see the benefit information, all the enrollments that you have done for yourself. So these are the two sections. These are the two sections which you could use um, for your purpose, which is, which is applicable to us. All right. Any questions up until now about how the look and feel of the application or any anything specific that you want to know before I move ahead? Uh, do we have any dependency on core HR and benefits? Uh, we do, in fact, because you need to have core HR for employees to be hired into the system. Um, and on top of that, you would need some payroll information, whether uh, the payroll is bi-weekly or monthly, so that your rates are calculated accordingly. So we do have some dependencies, but when I say payroll, I'm not talking about full-blown payroll implementation, but as part of your HR, when you hire somebody, you define the pay frequency, you define the whether it's hourly or salaried. So all of that information is needed for benefits to do it, the calculation. But payroll is not required, uh, full-fledged payroll is not required. So you can have your elements. Elements are the places where you would store your rate information, the calculated rate, and then you can uh, transfer it to any third-party application uh, which is running your payroll like ADP. So there is a dependency on your core HR. It needs to be there because the person needs to be hired in the system. But apart from that, uh, there's no other dependency. Okay. Thank you. All right. So what I would do is that I'll show you now how from a user perspective benefit looks like. And again, this is extremely high level. And we will go into the details uh, when we, uh, uh, from the next week onwards, when we start doing a little bit more deeper dive on all these uh, aspects of benefits implementation. So right now I clicked on about me um, benefits because I'm trying to show you how as a user the benefit would look like. And right now I'm the implementation user. So if you have benefit administrator rights, you can do uh, enrollment on behalf of an employee. 
through the administrative page or you could uh, mimic how it would look like uh, from an employee's eye uh, viewpoint and do it. So let's say I select an employee. Um, I'm just searching for a specific person because I have it and have him enrolled in the benefit program that I created. Let's click on continue. So you can either view your current and future benefits or manage people uh, that you plan to cover or you can change benefit elections. You can create contacts here. Um, I already have a couple of contacts created. Isn't there also a third option for the primary care physician? Um, the primary care, that is defined at the benefit program level, uh, the primary care. Uh, so you have either, over here as an employee, you would either define uh, a dependent or a beneficiary. I'm saying right here, isn't there, uh, there's a third option, there's view, view current, manage, and then the third option was a, was a primary care physician link, is that just disabled? Yeah, that would be disabled right now because I do not have uh, set up, so the benefit program that I created does not allow to assign any uh, primary care physician. So if I do configure it at the benefit program level, then you would see the third link uh, to de designate a primary care physician. So. When we talk about creating benefit programs, the different options that we have for creating benefit programs, you'll see that how we can des designate that. And depending on how you create and which benefit program you're enrolled in, the icons over here changes. So right now, the way I have created, and I have only created a bare bones uh, benefit program because um, as we go along, I would like to add to add some flesh to it so that you can see when we do make design choices, how it affects your enrollment uh, for an employee. So right now the benefit program does not have uh, a place to designate a primary care physician and that's why you do not see here. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fine. So, and you can go ahead and view your current. Uh, right now, what I did was that uh, I just uh, went ahead and uh, the default was all wave. So this employee was hired, and as part of hired, uh, they were always given a uh, default uh, benefit uh, election. But the I have also kept the uh, new hire uh, period, enrollment period, for, to be 30 days. So during that 30 day, the employee can go in and uh, do their selection of whatever uh, benefit plans that they want to select. So yeah, so I have not configured all the um, uh, the benefit uh, life events. Uh, even. So what happens is that I have only one life event configured right now, which is new hire, and that you cannot do as a self-assigned. But if I do create the marriage life event, you would see that the link would appear where it says that uh, self-assigned, so that you can, whenever you you actually got married, you could click on it and uh, you can initiate that life event uh, as an employee. So. Again, as I said that this is a very bare bones benefit program that I have created for now. But what will happen is that uh, as we go along and we create these uh, life events and we create uh, the benefit plans, we add to the benefit plan because right now you'll see that I have just medical, dental and vision. But if, once we create life uh, insurance plans, you'll see that all of that gets added and it shows your decisions how it affects uh, the creation of the benefit program. So right now, just bear in mind is that this is pretty bare bones. I have not, do not have a lot of uh, life events uh, configured. I do not have a lot of uh, medical plans configured. But the idea is that once I, once we do configure it as part of this uh, lesson, you would see how it translates to an employee experience. Yeah, we will do set up as part of the lesson. So every session I have some assignments for you guys. 
it'll go ahead and create those and i'll choose one of the options or plan that you have created out of all the plans that you guys are going to create and attach it to my benefit program and show you how uh, it looks like so i would ask you guys to create some life events and use one of the life event to associate with my benefit program and like the, like the one that you're talking about the self assigned one and show you how it affect employee experience okay again not going too deeper into how the application works in terms of benefits just want to keep it high level for today just so that it sinks in for everybody it sinks in a little bit more of how the application behaves from a fusion perspective because for some of you guys the whole application is new so i just want to cater to them and just get them an idea of how the application is, looks like uh, this is from the employee perspective now if i go in and look at from the implementation perspective we have the four icons here which is employee wellness enrollment plan configuration and reporting the two links that we would be working extensively for doing all our configurations and enrollments is the enrollment and the plan configuration uh, the employee wellness is something that they have added the social aspect of it where you could if you have something like fitbit or something like that, then you can create challenges organization wide and you could use you can actually connect with fitbit to import data and track all of that and this is something that the social aspect of wellness uh, that Oracle has added. And then you have the evaluation and reporting. As the name suggests, it's reporting on, let's say, your open enrollment or how many enrollments that has happened from the beginning of the year. So all of that is something which is going to be part of evaluation and reporting. And that is something definitely we'll touch on. But the two major links that you're going to always use is enrollment and plan configuration. That's where in the plan configuration, you configure your plans, your life events, and all that, your self-service look and feel. And enrollment is where you actually manage your employees. So once you have created all of these benefit programs, they need to be enrolled. Some of the life events need to be processed. And I've been talking about this life event a little bit. So just, just to get it, you know that the life event is something like a marriage or birth of a child. So Oracle calls that as a life event. And that gives you an opportunity to change your election during the year. So your open enrollment is a period where everybody is allowed to go in and uh, do their elections, and that happens once a year. But again, if any changes uh, that happen to your life, like a marriage or birth of a child, or a child becoming more than 26 years, so all of those are life events which basically affect how your elections or uh, benefit ele elections uh, appear in the system. So that gives the opportunity for an employee to make changes. So that's why we call those life events and all those life events need to be configured for the system to handle it correctly. So just to give you an idea, because I do not want to some of you to be uh, lost in the terminologies that we're using here. So we have uh, these four links um, where you do all the configuration and reporting. Then another important uh, link that I wanted to mention is the setup and maintenance. So you will see there's a setup and maintenance over here. And then if I click on the link here, you'll see that there's a setup and maintenance here. So if anything which is um, configuration uh, related and is not part of the link, which still needs to be configured, I'll talk about some of those like lookups. Um, then you have the benefit relationship. Some of these uh, links are not uh, there as part of the configuration link that we just saw over here when I click here. Um, I would not be able to access the lookup uh, task uh, from plan configuration. So all of that could be then accessed through setup and maintenance. And we're going to talk about creating an implementation project. So when we start from scratch, how we build our a project and how we maintain all of these links in a one place so we're going to talk about that so the three links which are extremely important going forward we, in next uh, few weeks we're going to use again and again extensively is the plan configuration enrollment and setup and maintenance 
So these are the three links that uh, you need to keep in mind. Um, even now, right now I'm doing implementation, uh, benefit implementation for a client. And that's all I always use. I use plan configuration, I use enrollment, and I use maintenance. Always there are always users of other links, uh, but 90 to 95% of the times I'm always using one of these three links. So that's how important they are um, as a benefit implementation uh, consultant. Okay, so I'll just go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, if you have any questions about the look and feel of the application, if you want me to um, show you around the application just a little bit, I, I would not mind because uh, for some of you, this is the first time you're seeing the application. And anybody, for everyone else who has already been in the system and who have used it, just bear with me for, for, five, for five minutes. I just want to take make sure that everybody is comfortable with how the system looks and how to navigate around the application. Okay. So we do not have any questions on it, so I'll go back to our presentation. And at 11.30, we will take a five-minute break, uh, and then we'll continue with our session. So we'll go talk about now, let's this is up until now we were just talking fluff like everything around your implementation now with this particular topic we are going now getting started so when you are assigned as a implementation partner for uh, doing an implementation of benefits the first thing that you would do is that you would go to functional setup manager and i'll show you where the functional setup manager is and create your project and as part of today's uh, assignment, you guys have to create your own implementation projects once I provide you the access to the application and get, keep them ready when we meet again next week. So what is a functional setup manager? So functional setup manager provides an end-to-end -end guided process for managing your functional setup projects through the entire implementation lifecycle. Using the FSM, and we always call the functional setup manager in a short form as FSM because it's just too long to keep saying functional setup manager. So the FSM, one can perform various tasks under an implementation project, depending upon the type of implementation. So let's say a client um, goes to Oracle and says that I want to implement core HR benefits and absence. So when you're creating an implementation project, what you do is that you'll make sure that those particular checkboxes, offerings are selected. And you then you create your project. And what happens is that it basically provides you a list of all the items that you need to configure to implement that particular offering. So that way, as an implementation consultant, you can manage everything in one place and make sure that you have configured everything that is needed and you have not missed out on something. So this is what is important when you use, whenever you do any implementation is you create your uh, implementation project uh, in FSM and you select your offerings, making sure that all the links that are available, uh, that, that are needed to be configured, all the pages that need to be configured have been covered because it, the FSM lists out all these uh, all the links uh, based on what you have uh, selected. And I'll, I'm gonna show you as part of the demo today that how to create your uh, implementation project so it becomes a little bit more clear. And if you're doing the implementation for absence, payroll, be it uh, comp uh, employee com compensation, all of that always follows the same process. So this is something which is common with uh, any implementation that you do, be it benefits or any other module. So if you're looking at the this diagram, you have your plan, so basically getting started. Then you configure, you configure your offerings where you select. There's a checkbox where you select what all offerings you need. You are basically selecting for your clients. Then you manage your implementation projects, uh, manage configuration packages. Um, either you once you have done your configuration, you export them so that they could be used for uh, 
your migration to the next environment. And then once all of that is done, you continue maintaining it based on your conversation with Clam. Because when you're doing an implementation, and how many of you guys have done an actual implementation with clients where you have gone in, uh, gathered requirements, and implemented a module? I just want uh, on chat, uh, just let me know if you have done it or not. Ivan has done it, Aditya has done it too. But uh, you have done an EBS, right? But you know how the whole uh, process uh, looks like when you go to a client and do an implementation. How about everybody else? I have only heard back from, Srinivas has not done it, so no. I have five more people on the call. So yes, Wes has done, but not benefit them. But you do know when you have when you go to a client how the whole process works like. And I have okay a few more on the call. Um, if you could let me know, at least I would know that if any one of you has not done in client implementation. Okay, it looks like nobody else is responding. But the idea why I'm why I'm asking is because when you're doing an implementation, you do a configuration, but there's always a lot of back and forth that happens with the client when they look, actually look at the system. So the current company that I'm working with, the um, the process that they follow is that we go to the client, we gather the requirements, and then what we do is that based on whatever our understanding is and the discussions that we had. We do the configuration and then we go back to them and show it to them for the first time. And that's when it like hits them. Oh, this is how the system is, uh, probably because they have never seen it before. And then they start thinking a little bit more deeper and then they come back with more configuration changes. They're like, oh no, this is not how I thought it, it would be. Uh, it should be this way. And then you take it back and you again make changes to your configuration. And again, you take it back and say that, you know what, based on our conversation, this is how now the system looks like. And they'll again come back with uh, some feedback. And usually the second time is a little lesser than the first one because they have already seen the system. They're already in the system. And the cycle keeps going on until you reach UAT. So the why I'm telling you is that this maintenance is extremely important. Once you create your project, implementation project. You always keep going back to it because based on whatever requirements that the uh, client provides, the new requirements, you would have to keep going back and making changes to your configuration, probably adding a new plan, probably changing your rate, uh, standard rate or variable rate or creating a new life event. So based on all of that, you would always keep tweaking your configuration. Like right now, how Ivan said that I do not see uh, self creation of uh, benefit or uh, life event. Because when we do go to a client and show it to them, see this is how the application looks like. And they'll be like, but I want my employee to create, I do not want to be creating all the life events on their behalf. So that's when you're like, okay, so you want a life event that needs to be uh, initiated by the employee. So that's when you do the configuration and uh, that link starts appearing and then you show it to them. So it's it's a back and forth process, process. And people who have already done that, they already know what I'm talking about. But if somebody who has not done it before, it it is not something that you just go in, get the details and you're out. You always keep going through the cycle again and again. So that's where the maintenance piece comes in now. So we have different terminologies uh, in FSM. Um, the offering, and offering is the highest level grouping of Oracle Fusion application functionality. Offerings are typically the starting points for configuration decisions. They are primary drivers of the functional setup of Oracle Fusion application. So these, like, you have workforce deployment, compensation management. These are offerings right at the top of the hierarchy. Then under each offering you have options. Each Oracle Fusion offering in general includes a set of core functionality and set of optional modules. 
which are called options like compensation management has got individual compensation it has got workforce compensation it's got benefits and it's got other couple of uh, of, of options under the offering so based on what your client wants to implement you will eventually go ahead and select your option that's at more granular level than offering then the feature unit of functionality that is part of an offering or option and identifies a rule for a specific business process so this is where you would be click click clicking and doing your configuration that's the feature so you have your offering under that you have your options so the offering is compensation option is benefits when you expand it then you have your features that's where you would start doing your actual configuration so it's basically cascades down and i will show it to you as part of the demo once we are into the system this is how the when you go and create your implementation project this is how it would look like you at the top you'll see that there's an offering um, you have all these offering compensation management under that either you have uh, workforce profile benefits individual compensation workforce compensation and when you click on it it would show as not started because you have obviously not started anything but when you do complete your configuration and mark it as complete you would be seeing that the implementation implementation status has changed to completed or in progress so that way you can track it during your life cycle project life cycle where are you at and all of this is done manually so you'll have to mark it uh, completed so if you're not following that then it becomes impossible to track so it's always a good industry practice to when you completed one uh, particular uh, configuration you mark it as complete and you keep doing that so that once everything is done then the implementation status shows as completed A few more terminologies what is an implementation project an implementation project is the list of setup tasks that are required for implementations of specific offerings and related options implementation projects are also the foundation for identifying what setup data will be exported and imported and in which order so as the name suggests it's just a list of projects or set of tasks um, which you basically would be uh, doing those tasks to be, configure an offering and the task list is a list of sequence set of tasks required to enable business functionality and the last one is the scope it sets the context of the task list and the setup data to export and import so I think the next slide um, and I would go through some of these uh, once I have shown you on the application but before I go through these slides and show you how the implement functional setup manager works um, right now, I think we are at my time. I'm in EST right now. It's 11:30. Take a quick five-minute break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the functional setup manager, how to create it, what are different roles in it, so that you get a better idea. Because that's your assignment at the end of the day. So let's take a five-minute break. We'll regroup at 11:35, and we'll start from there. All right, we're back. So before I do the demo, just quickly go through these slides and just to give you a little bit of more idea. So when you when I do open the application and show you how the implementation project looks like, at the top you'll see the implementation implementation project name. Then you'll have the offering used for the project, and then you'll have the task list. So when you open these task lists, that's where you would have all the configuration items where you could go ahead and do your configuration. Um, there are a couple of roles that you need to keep in mind when you're uh, doing an implementation. So the first one is the Oracle Fusion application super admin could perform all tasks in your Oracle uh, Fusion HCM implementation project. This particular super user can ta perform all the tasks, and the, you usually, whenever you're doing any implementation, you only assign one person that role, or maybe max two, uh, because they have access to everything, and they will be able to provide access to. Um, any other uh, implementation uh, consultant. The rep responsibility of implementation users are in three broad categories. Creation of users and security management, management of implementation projects, setup of uh, enterprise structures, 
So all of this is their uh, roles, uh, but usually what we have seen in bigger implementations where the client is larger, they, these are all separated out. Or if it's an extremely small client and the timeline is crunch, then you have just one person doing all of that. It all depends um, on how big or small the implementation project is based on your client and the time uh, frame that you're working with. So before we go to the implementation user role, let's talk about the application where how to create an implementation project and what when you do create how it looks like. So to do that, you basically first, um, so I'll go back to home so that I can start from the. So right now, as soon as you log in, this is where you'll land. You go ahead and click on uh, navigator icon on the left hand side. And right down here, there's setup and maintenance. The other way, other way of accessing it is through here when you click on the name. And there also you'll see setup and maintenance. So either one of those two, both of those links take you to the same page. So go ahead and click on it. Um, you'll see that there is a list. Uh, over here you can search all the tasks. So let's say you know the task already and you do not want to go through implementation project and uh, you do not want to go through all that. Then what you would do is that you would just go ahead and uh, type in your task and uh, it would show you all the tasks that is available and you can click on it uh, to access it. So I'll go ahead and click on implementation project. You'll see that there are already a lot of uh, users in the application and they have created their implementation project. So when you create your implementation project as per by next week, make sure that the you always put your name in front so that I would know who has created it, uh, just to give an idea of uh, whether it was created correctly or not. So I'll go ahead and use one of the projects that I have already created. It has uh, so you'll see that at the top you have, and I'll show you how to create a new one too. But I'm just going to take you through how it looks like uh, when it's already created. So you have your compensation management that was only one offering that was selected. And uh, under that, you have defined benefits, pay rate, based on whatever offering. And uh, when I click show here, the status, it shows as not started. And then you have your predecessor tasks. It always tells you which task needs to be executed before you execute the other task. So let's say if I expand defined benefits, So wherever you see zero, it means that there's nothing else that needs to be configured uh, prior to it. So all of these are standalone tasks that you need to go ahead and configure based on what your client requirement is. So if you, let's say you have to create benefit balances. A lot of times you do create benefit balances because you want to store benefit balance information. Talk about benefit balance in detail when we go through all these uh, individual tasks but just to give you an idea is that if an organization or your client says that I want to use benefit balance to store all the balance information for the contribution that somebody has made. Usually it is done and if the payroll is a third party application because they send the balances back. So you need a place to store that information. So you would use benefit balances for that. But not necessarily all the clients would use it. It all depends on your client requirement. This gives you the complete exhaustive list of all the tasks that needs to be completed before you configure your benefit offering, but not all these tasks are required. So you decide as an implementation consultant based on your discussions with the client, which task is required and which task is not required. Like third party administrators. Do you have third party administrators? Yes, then go ahead and configure it. If not, leave it aside. Benefit carriers, do you have any benefit carriers? So all of that benefit providers, so these are all standalone, then you have benefit eligibility. Now the benefit eligibility is something again, uh, you'll see that there's no predecessor because it is not dependent on anything else uh, because you basically create your eligibility profiles to determine who's eligible for your benefit program. Within benefit program, who's eligible for certain plans. So all of that is, done using eligibility. And again, all of this we are going to talk in detail when we meet again next week to 
basically go do a little bit more deeper dive into all of the task and how to create your benefit program. So these are all these building blocks that are needed for creating a benefit program. But if I go and click on benefit life events, you'll see that this is where you would create all the benefit life events. Now the benefit life events, as I mentioned, is some of them are pre-delivered as part of Oracle Fusion, but some of them you do create based on what life events your client needs to track. And as I, Ivan, you mentioned that you do not see self-defined because I do not have a self-defined benefit uh, life event created. Over here, when I go in, I would create a self-defined life event and you would start seeing that link. So all of these tasks that you see under the implementation project is needed based on what your client requirement is to configure your benefit offerings. And this is all that is needed. If there's nothing else out there which needs to be configured. So if the good thing is that all of this is all accessible at one place. There's no way you can miss something because if you keep expanding under benefits, you'll see everything that we need to do to configure benefits is available. So, and when we complete that, uh, when you click on it, it says go to task. So if I, let's say I want to import the benefit plan configuration, I want to use that task. I just go ahead and click on that small arrow icon and it takes me to the task. Once I'm done creating the, whatever configuration we need to do, I click on done and it takes me back. Okay. And then you can see the authorized roles, just to give you a little bit of uh, idea about what the authorized roles are. It provides you details of who is authorized for that particular task. Again, depending, can everybody mute their line? I can hear some background. Thank you. As you can see, the back, every every task has uh, authorized roles. What does What that means is that Again, based, based on how big or small your implementation is, some of these tasks would be divided into different roles. Possibly the enrollment display or cell service would be done by somebody else, and the configuration of your rates and uh, your plans is gonna be done by somebody else in your, um, in your company. So what will, what will happen is that an implementation uh, role super user would create two separate roles and give one particular group only access to configure the rates and one group only to access uh, configure the uh, cell service pages that way there's a segregation of duty and not one person is not stepping on on somebody else's toes again all the implementations that i have done all one person does all of that but there are there could be cases where you would want uh, it to be separated because just because the complexity is so huge. So you, what you would do is you'll create roles and assign these task specific roles. And when you click on it, you can see which roles are uh, authorized for that particular uh, task. So right now all of these roles can go and access that particular task. Um, I could go in as a security administrator and take out all of this and just leave benefit specialist in there. And a user who's got benefit specialist role can only then access manage benefit rates. So this is how you control access to your different tasks. So this is our demo environment and uh, we do not want to restrict, we do not want to put in security. So everybody gets to see everything here. So that's why you see all these roles having access to um, this individual task. Is there any question on this uh, functional setup manager and what these offerings are? Uh, yeah, Abhishek, uh, this is Aditya. I'm sorry, actually, my mic was not working before. Uh, see, a quick question is that, uh, you know, there is a set of tasks were followed from the top to down, top to bottom. So I can impl I can configure any task with respect to of the, is there is no dependency on each task, right? It does have some predecessor tasks. So if it says zero, then it means that there's no predecessor task. If it, if any of the values has a one in there or something in there, then you would see that you would want to click on it to see what the predecessor task is. Perfect. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, by the way, actually, I want to introduce myself because I was talking and you were not able and you started. Uh, so, uh, by the way, this is Aditya. Uh, and I'm actually completely from a different background, uh, probably a CRM side. So now I got into the Fusion Core HR and the talent management, but I'm planning to enter into the benefits. So, but I'm not, uh, I don't know anything ABCD of uh, benefits. So that's why I op opted for this training. I hope for uh, awesome. ABC. No problem. Great to have you here, Aditya. I'm, I'm happy that we have such a disparate group here uh, from different backgrounds. Uh, it really lends uh, itself well to the whole session because there would be different viewpoints and I absolutely love it. So yeah. um, going back to what I was trying to, um, I think there was one question from, uh, let me blow it up and see what was the question. Sometimes this Go meeting acts finicky if I want to access the, okay, there you go, I am able to expand. So, um, Chris is asking, uh, are there default authorized roles for particular tasks? There are default, benefit administrator has is the default role that has got access to all of these tasks. Um, then, then there's a benefit specialist also has access to all of these tasks. But again, when you are doing an implementation, the first thing that you would do is sit with all your team members and decide which role needs to access what. And based on that, your security admin would create uh, either a shell role. So what a shell role is basically, you do not, you never, never ever change any of your uh, uh, predefined roles, the which Oracle has provided. You never touch them because of twofold reasons. First of all, if you um, touch them and something goes wrong, there's no fallback option because that was the only role that you had. And the second one is that with every release, there could be changes to your role, delivered roles, and if you have made any change to your uh, delivered roles, it would all get wiped off. So that's why the first cardinal rule of uh, security administration is that you never, never, ever make change to a delivered uh, security role. You always, what you do is that you create your own role uh, based on your company's naming con con convention. So right now we have ERP web tutor. You, so you'll see that all the roles that we have created in the system that are custom starts with EWT. So that when you're looking at it, you would immediately know that that particular role belongs, uh, is a custom role and it's a company role that you created. And then you inherit the any pre-delivered role. So let's say a role is benefit administrator. So you create an EWT benefit administrator and then you inherit the benefit administrator role. And then you can ch make any changes that you want to because it solves both my problems. I can always fall back to benefit administrator if I have screwed anything uh, as far as my custom role is concerned. And if any changes that they make, it will be only made to the uh, pre-delivered role and not to my custom role. So none of my changes that I have made is getting wiped off. Always make sure that whenever you do that, I'm sure that as part of your implementation team, the security admin would take care of it. But as whenever you start, you always have a meeting with your security admin, decide who does what, which roles get accesses to these to answer your question uh, specifically. Yes, we have. Uh, specific role like benefit admin, benefit specialist, which have access to all of these tasks. But we can always take access out from some of these roles and add access to another role. That way we can manage it, okay? Another thing that you could do, again, that is uh, special for uh, larger teams, is that you can assign, right now I do not have uh, the assign, uh, function over here if I go in and click on assign tasks so I do not have any assigned uh, two over here but I could always go and click on assign task and select a user and assign it so that right now the implementation that I'm doing I have got three members working under me uh, for benefits it's a huge client there are a lot of uh, moving parts to it and I want to keep track of uh, who is doing what configuration so what I do is that I go ahead and I would assign each task to a particular user so that there's an accountability. And then you can put in due date as well. So you have your username and then you put in your due date. That way you can track it, uh, what the 
um, status or who's doing it and um, what's the status of that particular task is. It's always a, it's a nifty tool that you could use to do a tracking. Always all of these tracking is also done by your PMO, but within the application itself, you can do the tracking if you want to do at a very, uh, very uh, smaller level at your own team level. Okay, so, and then you can change edit status for each task. You can mark it as in progress. You can mark it as uh, completed. So all of that you could do. So let's see how to create an uh, implementation project. So your new, how would you do that? And look at some of these tool icons. This is something that is, that is used across uh, the application. It uses the same design uh, uh, terminology and uh, uh, design uh, uh, philosophy behind all of the pages that we have. So if you see a plus sign, that always means it's a create. If you see this pencil icon, it means it's always an edit. Cross sign is always delete. So these three are always there in most of the uh, uh, pages, actually all of the pages. If there is a, something to be created, you'll always see the plus sign. If something that needs to be edited, you'll always see the pencil icon. And if, you, if the page allows you to delete something, you'll always see the X icon or the delete icon here. Then you can freeze. Uh, so basically what freeze does that you, how the Excel use, uh, uses that you can freeze a certain portion of it. You can detach it completely. So I just don't want to be a part of this group. So when I click on detach, you see that it become a own window of its own. So then I can scroll it. So if it's a long list, you would want to detach it so that you can um, just scroll through all the list uh, in full screen rather than looking in a small window. And if there are words which are uh, flowing from one longer than uh, one line, you can always do a wrap. It exactly works like how it works in Excel. It basically takes you to the next line um, or takes that uh, text to the next line so that uh, you can keep your columns with short and still see everything that you need to see on that column. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new implementation project. So I click on this create icon and then I give a new name there. So I will give Abhishek Benefits Implementation Project. I can provide more information in here, uh, what kind of uh, description if you want to put in. Uh, status assigned to, so there would be one person that the whole implementation project will be assigned to who would be the administrator. So if you, if the person who is creating this implementation project is not the benefit uh, administrator, then the assigned to would change. Right now, I'm just giving it to myself. And then we have the start date, and then you can always put in a finish date. It does not affect anything. But again, for tracking purpose, uh, you could use it. Click on next. Now we have different offerings. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my slide that you have different offerings. Here you have the compensation management, financials, workforce deployment, uh, workforce development, and coexistence for HCM. So coexistence is when you have your HCM system somewhere else, like it could be ABIS or it could be PeopleSoft and then you're implementing compensation or benefits in Fusion. So what you do is you do a coexistence where it, it will, Fusion would need or at SimCloud would need that data, the uh, employee data from the code source system so that then it can utilize that internally to manage their compensation or their benefits. So the coexistence is meant for that. Um, slowly I have seen that the ad, there was in the beginning a lot of coexistence projects that used to happen, but nowadays there's not much uh, coexistence projects happening because uh, people in general want to move to cloud completely. Having a legacy component always is not great and keeping two systems in sync is always a nightmare. If anybody here has worked on a project where two systems you have to keep in sync on a daily basis, it's just calling for trouble. So we do not recommend 
but a lot of people have a lot of uh, customizations on their legacy system or they are so married to it that they set in their ways that they don't want to move to a new uh, application that's where i used to see a lot of coexistence projects uh, but nowadays i have not seen i have not been part of coexistence projects and i don't see also my colleagues uh, working on any coexistence project so i think it's something of something it's a past probably but still you would see here and there because uh, there always would be an outlier where somebody would want to have that kind of uh, arrangement next is compensation management all of your benefits uh, workforce profiles, individual compensation, all of this is basically part of your compensation management. So if you have if you have to configure benefits only, what you would do is that you would go ahead and click on compensation management, yeah, include, and then you have to include benefits. That way what will happen is that it will make sure that all your tasks for benefits is part of your implementation project. Um, financials I'll just skip uh, because financial is not uh, part of our um, basket um, from HCM aspect then you have the uh, workforce deployment you have payroll absence management workforce scheduling um, all of this you can select let's say you want to implement absence management so you go ahead and click on include and if there's any dependent uh, functional area so let's say for one uh, particular offering to exist there has to be um, uh, something else that needs to also be included it will always give you that warning like right now how it is saying is that if absence management is a dependent function area you need to basically first select workforce deployment and then only it will allow you to um, select so I'll have to go ahead and click on workforce deployment and then if I select uh, absence management and let me do that so just you select whatever you want to select as part of it and only one implementation is usually created per project so if you are doing core and you're doing um, comp and you're doing benefits and payroll you do not create separate implementation projects you create one implementation project and you select all these offerings and then uh, select it and if you have to assign it to different users as we saw each offering or each task could be assigned to a different user you could go ahead as a administrator implementation administrator and do that we always do that so there's career development and the offerings that you see here um, is based on what your client has part so you don't see everything here as part of the offering if the client has bought let's say the whole HCM suite uh, including talent performance career all of it you'll see all the offerings here and you can include it but let's say the client has not bought everything you would not see everything over here so the include the offering that you see is based on what client has provisioned or bought from Oracle and how much uh, money they have paid for uh, all these offerings so based on what they paid for that's what is going to be shown here so when you once you do that you just basically what you do is you save an open project there are two options whenever you see a button with an arrow icon it means that that particular button has multiple options to it so always remember to click click that uh, downward arrow icon um, because it will basically give you all the options that you might have on that uh, click of the button so here we have uh, save an open project and save and close so let's say you did create something and you just go don't want to immediately start working on it you would do save and close but if you want to do more work on that project then you will click on save and open project so it will save and then open that project um, I'm going to cancel it because I have already created the project um, when you create your own project you can go ahead and save an open project and see how it looks like um, what are the different tasks just click around the task to see what uh, those pages look like when you when I give you the access today after this session so that you can become familiar with all the different links to tell you one more thing is that I've talked about all this FSM and how to do that but I hardly ever use it for benefits I don't use it so what do I use really for benefit configuration I use this for tracking 
if I have completed something, I'll mark it as uh, completed or in progress. But what I really use is if I go ahead and click on Navigator, and if you remember, I spoke about these uh, links here under Benefit Administration. That's all I use. So if I click on Plan Configuration, you'll see that I have got a list of tasks under general benefits, eligibility, manage life events, plans and program, rates and coverage. Then we have enrollment display, extracts, and manage benefit configuration copy. So basically it exports the plan configuration, whatever you have created. So even though I all and all these tasks basically if I go in and look under my offering, you'll see these tasks are available there as well. But it always helps because uh, from here is because you can click on the link on the right hand side. Um, how you do it is that there is a small note uh, notepad icon on the right top corner. It's easy to miss, but all the screens always keep on a lookout. Whenever you click go on a screen, it always gives you more uh, options to navigate uh, from that screen. So when you expand that, you have your heading section and then you have all the different links that you would be using to do do your configuration. So this is what I use. What I use in my implementation project is for tracking to see what has been started, what has what is in progress, and what has been completed. Because I can lose track uh, over a course of a project when I'm doing implementation, I can lose track of what I have completed and what I have not completed. So it's always good that if under implementation prog project you do that, go ahead and mark it as complete if you have completed the configuration. But for purpose of actually doing the configuration, this is where I go in and do my uh, different configurations. Any questions up until now? So, once again, so I have one some question here. Again, a stupid uh, go to meeting. Sometimes I act a little. If only I can make it expand. Just give me a moment. Abhishek, this is Viz. Um, if I, I, I typed in the questions. I wasn't sure if you were at a stopping point for us to ask. But um, what I was wondering is if you don't select a task in FSM, mm -hmm. will does that impact what's available here in this uh, the, the expanded menu you have right now that you're showing us no. on the right. So you have to select benefits. So at the very beginning, if you select benefits, um, you do not select individual tasks under benefits. Okay. okay so okay. as a part of the configuring, you have to select benefits, and then all of these tasks become uh, available to you. But the funny. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. The funny thing is that you do not have to create implementation projects at all. <laughs> uh, okay. So even if you do not select an offering or you do not create anything, you can directly go in onto this page and start doing your configuration. The It's a best practice from Oracle because again, for the purpose of tracking, a purpose of assigning, and if there's a small project, it always is very easy because everybody is doing the same. One person is doing everything. Then it becomes a little less complicated, but when you have multiple people within a team doing your configuration, and maybe one person is assigned to do configuration for UK and one other person is assigned to do configuration for uh, US and all of that. That is when you would want to use implementation projects because then you can track all of that progress. It's always, Oracle always advises to use the implementation project, but if you don't select over there, it, it does not impact anything. It's, it's just for tracking purpose. So it doesn't have, uh, so right now, for example, in EBS, if I do a setup, I usually do it in a development environment, and then we might replicate it several times, right, in different environments. So does FSM help with any of that, like to move configurations from one environment to another, or not, not so much? No, but good question, though. So right now, even for ERP Web Tutor, we have two environments, and right now I'm in development environment, now test. So you'll see that it says EWB test. If you right. see the top right. URL, all your configuration, usually we have two environments. Uh, we're not a big company, but bigger companies have like six, seven 
eight environments. Right now that I'm working, the client that I'm working with has got eight environments. Mm -hmm. So what they do is that they do start at the very, they define, let's say, a couple of environments at dev. So they would start at dev, and if I move this around, and if I click on it here, at the very bottom, you'll see that once you have done the configuration, you can export the configuration. You see at the bottom? I see, yeah. And then once you have exported the configuration, you go to the new environment, which is basically empty. It does not have anything uh, configured. And then you click on import the configuration, and it basically is a file. So what you do is that uh, you select that file, and it when you import it, it basically loads all the configuration that you have created. So this is how we move between one environment to another environment. Having said that, not all the configuration gets exported and imported through the plan configuration. <laughs> so your yeah, fast formulas do not move. Um, your general configuration does not move. A lot of things do not move as part of this export and import. You have to do it manually. <laughs> okay, so the, the other question I had was sort of related. So the like for example, you were you had mentioned about configuring elements, right? So mm -hmm. elements and uh, I guess the concepts are the same. Elements and links, is that correct? Still, or I have no background from EBS, so I'm I, I'm sorry oh, okay. I'm not be able to do. Okay. It. Maybe it is sure. elements is where you store all your rate information, and it's tied with payroll. If that is that payroll. what link was? Yes, yes. So that's my question. So so do you have to then? Um, in FSM, would you have to select the payroll offering also? Um, not really, not, no, you do not have to because okay. a lot of clients do not implement payroll as part of their benefit implementation and especially who are on ADP because it takes away a lot of their day-to-day -day, um, payroll uh, um, dependencies. So what they do right. is that you basically select only benefits, but you do create the elements because when you're exporting the data over to ADP or any third-party payroll application, my extract will basically go and read the elements uh, to get the information for that particular pay period, pull that data out, mostly it is rates, and amount or amount, and send it to my payroll system so that they can deduct that particular amount. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Ivan has got one question, so let me again try to access this. So I think Ivan has got two questions, right? Let me see what question they have. Is the cloud import functionality the same as again? Ivan, I would not be able to speak on. Behalf, I do not want to give you half cooked information because I have never worked with EPS. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. But uh, what it does is that to answer your second question, so it copies only rates, options, plan, and program with a prefix to the target environment. Um, it basically only uh, copies plans, not even programs. So when we do that, you'll get to see um, uh, how the import and export works because I have something which uh, I have exported from my. Uh, another uh, installation that I did. I'm going to import it as part of the plan, so I'll show you how that also works as part of this session, uh, ongoing session of to do that export and import. Um, to give you an idea of what is important and what is exported, because that is important that you're aware of what is important and exported, because you need to know what you need to do configure manually in your next environment. Okay, so that's part of the session that I'm going to cover. Um, the import and export. I have a file ready from another application. I'm going to pull it and show you what got imported. So you know what the current state was and after importing what got added. But that I would do at the very end. I do not want to um, affect the configuration that we are doing in the system um, perspective. So let's go ahead and use this benefit program that I have created from next week onwards. At the very end, I'll show you how we could export that, whatever we have configured, and import it uh, um, into the application, and what gets imported and what you need to do manually. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Abhishek, uh, you said that uh, uh, fast formulas and uh, common configuration 
would not be exported using this managed benefits configuration. Correct. Config. Correct. So, what do you mean by common configurations? Common configurations like uh, <clears throat> benefit relationship, it would not be exported. So, benefit relationship is whether the relation, and I'm going to talk in detail about what benefit relationship is, just to give you an idea is that whether you want to use primary assignment, and that is applicable for clients who have multiple assignments, multiple jobs. Um, again, you guys mostly are from EBS background. If you are from PeopleSoft background, it basically corresponds to your employee record. So if you have multiple jobs, you have multiple assignments, but benefit needs to know which assignment to use, which one to use as your primary source to calculate their benefits. That's when your benefit relationship comes into picture. But that benefit relationship is not exported because that is something which is uh, very specific to your client environment. So that is something you have to do it manually. That was one example. Fast formulas do not get exported. Eligibility profiles also don't get exported uh, for some reason. So you have to create the eligibility profiles in manually in your uh, new environment. But having said that, every release they are including more and more of the items that were not getting exported as part of this uh, export release 7 i remember when i started i could not even export the plan configuration we had to do you would not believe me everything manually one by one create so if an the good thing is that the uh, the client that i worked with had only one benefit program but down the line i have worked where they have like 10 different benefit programs depending on different uh, countries and the worst part is, which is going something going to be very good, getting better with release 12, is that the rates that you have to create, even though those are global rates, you still have to create your rates for every legal entity. So let's say you have 20 different legal entities. Just imagine how many rates you will have. And all of that would need to be created manually. So it was a good, fun experience. One, one thing is that all of this, that export and import that I'm talking about, even rates, can be prepared in a workbook. We'll talk about that, how we can configure everything in a workbook and load it so that I do not have to do it manually. So that is one thing that we used to do, even though the export import functionality was not available, is to use a workbook to load information into the system. And a lot of these pages were, um, or the tasks were, Oracle thinks that there's a lot of rows that need to be entered. They have thankfully provided this uh, prepare in workbook so that you can prepare and load, especially rates. Or everything else, how many plans you would have in a program? Max 10, 15. Max you'll have three, four benefit program. Still manageable, right? But when you come to rates and variable rates, they get sometimes get out of hand. You have like hundreds, 150 based on variable rate is like, okay, for this salary range, you will get this particular rate and then for this salary range you will get another rate and that needs to be done for each and every other legal entity so just imagine what's the number of rates that you have to configure so for that they have prepared in workbook you have a format you put all that information in that format um, in an excel load it and everything gets loaded at once okay all right, so before we wrap up, I just want to quickly go through some of the security aspects. We did speak about security. Uh, how benefit conversion is handled. So benefit conversion is basically, uh, there is HDL. Through HDL, we handle the benefit conversions. We have a, a format for your uh, enrollment. You have format for your contact. You have, we have format for your balance. So all of that we basically provide to our clients. They fill in that information in that format and then the data is loaded through HDL. But I'm not going to go into HDL because that's the technical side of it. What we do as an implementation consultant is that we provide the worksheet and we explain the different columns to our clients. But how once we get that file, it's the technical team who does the load. So. We do have a technical course available. If any of you guys are interested in the te technical side of it, go ahead and uh, enroll in that. That would help you in understanding how the HDL and the PBL and all of that works. But for the purpose of this lesson or this training, we are going to only, um, I'll, I'm, I'll try to show you a couple of 
HDL formats and explain you the fields in it. But how it is loaded is out of the scope for this training session. Okay. All right. So before we wrap up today's session, I wanted to quickly talk about there are a couple of slides on security. We'll talk about that, how security per, pertains to benefits. And just just to give you an idea, because there's not much you do really in security and benefits. There are very set of a small uh, handful of predefined roles, which you usually end up extending based on what your client requirement is. But apart from that, there's not much happening there. Okay, so I'll take you back to the presentation. Okay, OIM, this is where, again, a little bit technical, but just to let you know is that this is how we create the, we spoke about the architecture right at the beginning. So all the roles are created in a separate application, which the Oracle calls at OIM. It uh, does license OIM separately to organizations to manage their uh, LDAP for different application, but it uses that OIM for Oracle uh, HCM Cloud as well. And if you go in, you can basically, you'll see these screens. Um, the task name is create implementation user. Um, once you click on the, when you go to the task, uh, basically it opens in a new window. You click on create user. Uh, once you click on create user, basically you can go ahead and create the last name, first name. And then you have different tabs in here. Uh, one of the tab is called roles. This is where you assign a specific role to a user. And based on that role, then the user can either access something or not access something. Hey, before we get too much into the uh, security part of it, a question there I had regarding the, the workbooks. Oh, okay. So, so previous yeah, ERP. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So previous classes with the ERP uh, web cloud training, they provided workable uh, workbooks. Is that something that we'll have available as well as part of this class? I have a couple of, um, so the workable workbooks, when you say that, was it already having data in it or is just the Excel sheet? Uh... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sample, uh, sample source of all I'll, I'll, I'll pull up something that I have. Uh, I can give you some sample. I, I did not, uh, okay. because what, what my idea was to just give you the, uh, show you how the workbook looks like the with the headers and because for every implementation that values would differ right but I can pull up something and send it to you if that is something that would help uh, what I feel yeah. would help is only the explanation of what the workbook uh, structure is but I'll throw in something in there yeah I think it'd be good to have and, and reference if we need it to kind of like go back and ever kind of like look back at it as a sample Okay, I uh, will look uh, look up something, and I'll have to scrub it uh, with client because I have some client data in it. Yeah. So I'll scrub it out. Yeah, that's fine. And, uh, then send it to you so that uh, it's uh, useful too. Okay. Um, Thank you. No problem. Um, anything else, uh, Ivan? Before we get a little bit deeper into security. No, no, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. So this live demo is basically showing you how the implement, um, FSM looks like. So we did already that. The last, there are only a couple of slides, the different types of security that we have. Um, again, very high level, I would not go too deep into it, but just to give you an idea, when you're talking about security, you should know. An abstract role is, it defines a worker's role independently of the job. So I'll give you the example of what an abstract role looks like. A job role defines the job that a worker is hired to perform. So it could be an employee, it could be benefit administrator, so that's a job role. A data role is combines a worker's job with data instances that role can access, such as all workers in a legal employer. So let's say you are a benefit administrator, but you are only benefit administrator for one legal employer. That's where data role comes into picture, where it limits your access to a particular uh, data based on param certain parameters. So let's say the parameter here is your legal employer, legal entity. Then if you have access to only one legal entity, even though you are benefit administrator, 
you'll only be able to see the data for that particular legal employer only if the plans and programs are not global. If they are global, then you will be able to see everything. But if the plans are created at the legal employer or legal entity and benefits is also created at that level, then if you have access to only one legal entity, you would not be able to see other legal entity. The aggregate privilege combines a single function, security privilege with related data security policies. So <clears throat> I will talk about what the aggregate in the next slide uh, that will give you an idea. And duty is basically is duty is which task you can perform. So even though you are benefit administrator, but with the benefit administrator, I only want you to perform these five tasks. So if you remember, I spoke about when we were creating the implementation user, is that the um, the due, some of the tasks could be performed by some and some could be not performed by somebody else. That's the duty role. That's where we say that, okay, you can perform this task and you cannot. So that's how we control um, access or security. So data is basically when you already are on that screen, what data you see, that's what the data role is for. But duty basically stops you going into that task completely. So it's the two different levels. And the duty, I believe, is more higher level where you have a page, whether you can access that page or not. And data is you are already in that page, but what data you can view. So just uh, just to give you an idea. Um, Oracle already provides some of predefined security artifacts like job roles, aggregate privileges. As I said all of these predefined uh, uh, values are already provided. Um, privilege at the very bottom level is the privilege where it says manage benefit options. This is the privilege that you have, whether you can manage benefit options or not. Aggregate privilege, benefits, enrollment, maintenance duty. So under benefit uh, options, it basically, if you keep combining it together, uh, individual tasks, it says benefits, enrollment, maintenance duty. So um, it's a little bit at higher stage. It's basically aggregates all the different privileges that you have in the system. And then at the very top, you have your job role where all your aggregated privileges then roll into one job role and that job role is then assigned to an employee. So again, let's go from top down. You, are, you have an employee, you have a job role, then you have aggregate privileges, which basically is not something that you create, but it all depends on what individual privileges that you have been given. So a privilege cannot directly be given to a user. Privilege is always given to a role. And then that role is assigned to the user. Uh, there's just a very simple, this is a simplification though. It's not as simple as this. You have your data policies, which also under privilege uh, restrict on what data you can see. Then you have your duties. So it's just a little simplification of how the security looks like. But just to give you an idea, because I do not want to make it a security uh, uh, training. Uh, so this is how the security is currently. Some of the roles that you would be hearing a lot about is benefit manager and administrator. This is one role. This job role can use the setup and maintenance and plan configuration work areas to configure and manage benefit objects, such as organization, derived factors, plan types, rates, and uh, enrollment display. So that is your administrator. Uh, benefits manager is or a specialist is somebody who can manage life events, certifications. That is on a day-to-day -day task uh, that would be a benefit manager role or can provide um, overrides and grant exceptions for certain uh, participant or run batch processes. So that is a benefits manager. And then employee is somebody who can access their own enrollments. So these are three broader category of uh, roles that we have. Again, within each, you can segregate it even a little further. Okay, one only one uh, role can run batch processes and another one can do overrides. It all depends on how your client wants it to be set up. But three overarching uh, groups are basically the first one is administrator who can cr create new configurations, uh, modify existing configurations. Then you have manager who can uh, create life events, day-to-day -day activities in your organization. 
and then the last one is your empl employee who can go in and either self uh, start and uh, what do you call um, life event or could uh, do enrollment as part of your open enrollment okay so with that we are at the end of today's session um, i have covered uh, most of what i had uh, set out to cover in today's session just to give you guys an overview tell you about uh, all the supporting actors before we get into the main play next uh, next week this is the assignment for you guys for tonight or for the next whole week is to go ahead and create your implementation project do remember to prefix it with your name either you could put your initials or you can put in your full first name and uh, create an implementation project uh, to so that you can implement Oracle Cloud benefits. Would like to see how you guys do that. It's pretty simple, but just to give you, a, uh, just to let you go inside the system and do something just to get a feel of it, it is important that you start with an easy task. So any questions before we wrap up and uh, close this uh, session today? Any questions that you have for the next week also of how the structure would be and if any clarifications that you have to want uh, for the next week? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, hi, Abhishek. Uh, quick question. Uh, what is the, uh, like, uh, I want to know the instance details actually. Like, are you going to send me? On the yes, yes. Or? We will. We will send it uh, within a day. Why we wait until a day is because any of you guys have, are not happy with how the session has gone today, or you don't think that I'm going to add any value, then you have 24 hours where you can ask for money back and we will return everything back. But we do not want to give access until then, so because a lot of people we have seen in the past is that they get the instance access and then it, we do not want to revoke it. We do not want to go down that path. So. In 24 hours, if you guys are not uh, refunded any of the uh, amount, then we will send you the access uh, link with user ID and password. Okay. Hi, Abhishek. This is Kush. Uh, this is Aditya here. Yeah, Aditya. Um, uh, Abhishek, do you have any uh, 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 like uh, set of questionnaires uh, for uh, benefits implementation? As like for core HR generally, when we go for implementation, we would have like set of questions for payroll. We would have set a set of questions that we uh, use them for requirement gathering, right? So, like, do you have similar kind of any set of questionnaires for like benefits implementation? Because as I'm new to benefits, so like, uh, I understand where you're hmm. coming from, um, Aditya. But with benefit, what happens is that it's always fairly flat in terms of what is required. Um, plans, mm -hmm. what plans are required, what rates you have, um, who gets to see, get those plans, and uh, what been. So we do not really, there's always something we call that a workbook, configuration workbook, where we uh, gather all this information. But we do not have any questionnaires because the questionnaires are always flat. We already know always what questions we have to ask. So if I do, personally, I do not have any questionnaire that I can share with you. and. Whatever I have is my company specific questionnaire, which I would not be allowed to share with you. So um, I can cook up something if you want at the end of the session. Uh, once these sessions are over, you still have access to it 90 days. If you want something, mm -hmm. I can scrub it and send it to you. But as part of the session, I was not, um, because as I said, with core HR and payroll, there are so, so many moving parts that you want to have a questionnaire to ask that. But with benefits, is always set. It's basically clients who provide us the list of plans, their options, their rates, and their any eligibility criteria. And based on that, then we go ahead and create their uh, benefit program. So there's not much uh, that does not change a lot in terms of benefit implementation. It's always a flat structure where we whatever clients want, we have to implement. What about things like uh, the new offering of the? default benefit relationship where you can either set it up, I believe, at country or legal entity, and then you got to define whether you're allowing multiple processing. Right. So that is like something that kind of... leads into, that's that's why I said it's more like general general and not related to really benefits is because 
that is in conversation with our core HR uh, folks where we sit down and say that, hey, do you have multiple assignments? Yes. Okay. Uh, how many countries, how many LDGs you are in? So that is a core HR questionnaire that they already send out and gather that information and that feeds into benefits. Does that make sense? Yeah, so let's say if somebody says a company a client that has used multiple assignments, we'd wanna we'd wanna use multiple assignment processing because isn't the the primary assignment used for eligibility? So what yeah. would be the purpose of having the multiple assignment processing? So we always use the primary assignment for eligibility, and uh, so what happens is that the multiple assignment processing you always have to assign one as primary. So let's say. Uh, even though your employer, and I'll give you one example where it happened, so real-world example where it made more sense to you, is that you have multiple assignments and somebody got uh, transferred for a deputation, but the client, did, client wanted that particular assignment to be used for uh, benefit calculation instead of your if their primary assignment. And that can happen now because probably they went in, went to UK and they want the UK benefits to apply and not the US benefits for whatever period that they were deployed. In that case, you change your uh, benefit relationship to not be the primary. Uh, for that particular, that's an override that you do for the employee um, so that you could use that uh, to drive your eligibility and your rate calculation and all of that. So. It all depends on what a client wants, and uh, but as you said, that your eligibility is always driven by your one uh, default relationship, benefit relationship. The default is always primary, but you can always change that. And we'll talk about different scenarios, uh, what different scenarios are, and what are points of consideration when you're creating a benefit relationship and how it impacts your uh, processing, benefit processing. Okay. That is something for. Next class, Ivan. I think for this one, what I think I'll yeah, think yeah, no, I, I figured yeah. I figured we'd get into it, and I have a couple different scenarios of what would be best practice, as in uh, to set it up, and then if you do multiple, do you set it up at country level, or do you still break it down by legal entity? But I mean, we could definitely get into that after. I think the benefit relationship when you create, you always give you the option to do at the both uh, legal entity and yeah. We'll talk about the consideration. Like I had one client who had. Uh, benefit programs in UK, Canada, and US. So we basically created based on the country level because benefit programs are based on an LDG, and I don't know if you know about LDG or not. LDG is yeah. the legislative data group, data. which is again... Uh, data group, yeah. So it's always all specific to a country. So it's always a better idea and industry practice to base it on a country because within a country, then you can have uh, multiple legal entities but all of the legal entities will always follow the same uh, federal regulations. So you would want your benefit relationship available. So we'll talk about it in detail and uh, what different considerations or options we might have in terms of creating benefit relationship. And that's the only piece where there is always a deliberation of how you want to do that. Because once you're done with your benefit relationship, how you have to create a plan, there's no deliberation. This is what your client wants and that's what you have to create, right? So that's the only piece where there is a little bit of deliberation of uh, what your design choices would be. There are a lot of deliberations that happen when you're creating a core HR workforce structure because a lot of clients do not know how what a business unit should look like, how their legal entity should be, and what their tax reporting unit would be. But for benefit, that's what I said. It's always a flat, flat structure. This is my st plan. This is my rate. These are my options. Go ahead and configure it. Abhishek, this is Viz. Um, so you've kind of touched a little bit on, um, you know, organization structures, and I um, I know you don't have the EBS background, but I, I understand that the organization structures differ uh, between EBS and um, core HCM in, in Fusion. So are you, is there any plan to kind of at, at a high level cover any of that? Because it could be that we have like eligibility rules, for example, that could differ based on the organization, right? Um, once the structure is created, uh, and I would touch just a little bit, uh, Wiz, but if you really want to get a good lowdown on creating an enterprise structure, because I see mm -hmm. it as a 
one class, one full three to four hours in itself. And that itself, oh. that also would not do justice to workforce structure. Right. I've seen projects go insolvent because the workforce structure was not created uh, or enterprise structure was not created properly. So I think something which we did not take it lightly. As a group, this only thing where the, all the implementation consultants sit together and brainstorm it so that if you get that wrong, then your whole applic whole uh, deployment is doomed because uh, the, you cannot go back and change it. Uh, you can always change your plan and delete a plan and change a plan, right? But you cannot really uh, change your workforce structure. So again, I will touch on it, but the scope of it is so large that I do not think I would be able to do justice to it. How? Sure. However, I'm not pushing a pushing my uh, product here, but there's another set, uh, training here, which is core HR training. Yes. Something that you might be interested in doing. There's another very fantastic uh, instructor that we have uh, who works with me, worked with me for a long time, and uh, he does a pretty good job in explaining your enterprise structure and what impact uh, it might have on your design choices. So. I'm not pushing it, uh, Wiz, you can always get it from some other source, you can get it from Oracle, but if you're interested in it, I would highly suggest that uh, go ahead and do that training and uh, it would really help you. Yeah, I, I, I saw that it, uh, you had one that just started, I think it overlaps though with the, the dates for this benefits class. So. Right, but um, I think once they are done with their session, they would uh, post it as a um, self uh, self paced uh, training. Oh, I see. Got it. Again, I'm okay. not pushing that, but I'm just saying if you if you want to learn more, that's all, there's always something. And if you do not want to do all of that, then uh, books are there, but I, I don't think how helpful they would be. But understanding core HR, even if you're just doing benefits, is important. As Ivan said, that we have to make some design considerations for. Uh, creating benefit relationship and it all is a cascading effect what you decide at the enterprise structure level has a direct impact on one how you create your benefit relationship so knowing your enterprise structure you knowing your payroll structure as well because you're not only creating enterprise structure but when we get to weed stuff weeds of it you'll see that all these elements feed into payroll and if you have your payroll system in-house you need to know a little bit about payroll as well, of how it would impact. Like, uh, for me, probably if I'm saying bi-weekly, monthly uh, payroll or weekly payroll, it makes more sense because I've done uh, payroll projects. But from a perspective of somebody who's completely new, probably it would uh, throw them a curveball. So I will try to touch as much as I can as part of this. Uh, but again, I'm limited. Uh, I have only next six days of three hours each, that's like 18 hours. Uh, and you see that when you start really talking about it, it takes a longer time. So I'll try my best to cover as much as I can. Uh, and and at the same time, not bore you guys with too much detail. But uh, if we are not able to cover it, then uh, some of these topics, they have dedicated training sessions, both with Oracle and here at uh, ERP Web Tutor as well. Go ahead and take those uh, lessons to get a little bit more understanding about those topics. Because these modules do not work in silo. Even though we do trainings in silos, but all of these are so intertwined that uh, you need to know one to be really good at the other. So that when you're in front of the client, you can speak with confidence and give them a, uh, an advice that really works for them. Because that's what we do, right? As an implementation consultant, we go in and try to do our best to give them a solution that works for them so that you, when you walk away from a project, you're proud that you did a good job. And for that, you need to have some informed decision, informed, uh, informed uh, inputs on some of these modules like Core HR and Payroll. They work so close to each other. And even absence. A lot of clients use benefits to manage their absence because um, they do not want to implement absence module. That's something that I would not cover, but that is something that is being done by some clients. And it would also 
be required of an implementation consultant, benefit implementation consultant, or know a little bit about absences too. Right now, focus on benefits, but I would always suggest that keep reading, keep gaining knowledge about these modules. It will help you in getting a little bit more broader in your uh, experience with these uh, modules. Okay? Thank you. No problem. So, any more last questions uh, before I wrap up? I know I'm over. All right, so if I had no more questions, then I'll wrap up this session. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining this meeting and being part of this training session. I would uh, expect uh, going forward the same level of involvement from you guys. Ask questions if you have. We'll brainstorm if something, if I'm not able to answer immediately. There are a lot of uh, points that might come up which I might, might not have answers to it. But I can assure you that I will definitely get an answer for you, if not immediately by the next class. And during the uh, week, go ahead. All right, okay. So that's it then. I'll wrap up this meeting. Thanks again, everybody. We'll meet again next week. And in the meantime, by Monday and end of the day, expect all your login credentials. And go ahead and uh, work on this assignment.